In my last lecture, I introduced to you the concept of four vectors in relativity. Four vectors are physical quantities that have four components in space-time. It has three components associated with the three directions in space, x, y, z, and one component associated with time. So these are physical quantities that are represented not just in three-dimensional space, but actually in four-dimensional space-time. In my last lecture, I not only introduced to you the concept of four vectors, but I also obtained some of the very common four vectors like velocity four vector, momentum four vector, acceleration four vector, etc. Now the question is, what is the use of four vectors in special relativity? Well, the four vector concept opens up the possibility of performing various kinds of calculations that are consistent with the principles of relativity. Just like in normal mechanics, we use the concept of vectors in Euclidean space to perform different kinds of calculations in mechanics. Similarly, in relativistic kinematics, we can use the concept of four vectors to perform different kinds of calculations to understand different kinds of relativistic phenomena. For example, if you are studying the decays of subatomic particles, if you are studying nuclear reactions or interactions of high energetic particles, then the concept of four vectors will simplify our understanding of those kinds of phenomena. In fact, in today's lecture, I am going to take a very specific example of the relativistic Doppler effect and I am going to obtain the relativistic Doppler effect uh, shift in frequency using the concept of four vectors. Now, you are probably already familiar with relativistic Doppler effect. What is relativistic Doppler effect? Well, this is the apparent change in the frequency or wavelength of some sort of an electromagnetic radiation that is emitted by a source due to the relative motion of an observer with respect to the source. So, it is called relativistic Doppler effect because the apparent shift in the frequency or the wavelength arises as a result of relativistic phenomena, for example, time dilation. So whenever some source is emitting some sort of a frequency, the moving observer will measure a different frequency due to time dilation effects. Now I have actually done a lecture on this where I obtained the shift in the frequency by talking about the concept of time dilation. But in today's lecture, I am going to obtain the similar expression using four vectors. So you may ask the question, sir, why we are doing the same thing over again? Well, it is kind of interesting to do it from a new perspective, right? If you have uh, listened to my last lecture where I introduced the concept of four vectors, it opens up the possibility of performing various calculations uh, 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 and prove those same kinds of relativistic phenomena. So it's very interesting to use the concept of four vectors to uh, sort of play around with different kinds of uh, physical phenomena where relativity is involved. So, quick video, let me demonstrate to you what happens and how to use the concept of four vectors in the case of Doppler effect. So, we have some kind of a source, okay, we have some sort of a source and I'm going to call that as S frame that is emitting some sort of a radiation uh, electromagnetic radiation at a particular angle, let's suppose phi, uh, it has some kind of an energy, the frequency of the electromagnetic radiation is nu, so the energy of this electromagnetic radiation or light photon will be h nu. What is the magnitude of the momentum of this photon? Well, the magnitude of the momentum will be given by E is equal to or P is equal to E upon C, also known as h nu upon C quite simple. However, if we have uh, another observer, let's suppose I call this as an observer, a moving observer and I call this as the S bar frame, the moving observer has a relative velocity of V with respect to the source. In that situation, the moving observer also looks at the same photon. This is by the way, not two different photons. This is the photon as observed by the source and this is the same photon as observed by a moving observer. So with respect to a moving observer, that same photon will appear to have a different energy. Let's suppose E dash is equal to H nu dash and therefore the magnitude of its momentum will be P dash is equal to H nu dash upon C. So E dash upon C, so H nu dash upon C and the angle will be let's suppose phi dash. Okay? So we have a source 
and from the perspective of a source a light photon has a particular energy and a momentum and we have a moving observer from the perspective of the moving of the observer the same photon has different energy momentum and different angle at which the light photon is going forward so if i want to find out what is the difference in the frequencies as measured by the source as opposed to as measured by the moving observer then i am going to follow the concept of four vector momentum or energy momentum four vector so you may remember from my last lecture we uh, defined uh, the concept of energy momentum four vector so energy momentum four vector was denoted by p nu right it has four components the first component or the zeroth component uh, which is actually the time component is given by energy upon c speed of light e upon c the first component uh, or rather the x component is the relativistic uh, momentum px then we have py and then we have pz so whenever we study a photon or a particle from the perspective of a source or a moving observer and we want to define the four momentum associated with that photon or a particle then we can construct the four vector momentum for that particular photon using this kind of a construction. So let us do that for our photon but from the perspective of both the source as well as the observer. What is the source here? Well the source is nothing but the xy plane. For simplicity of calculations, I'm keeping everything at the z is equal to zero plane and I'm only considering x, y here, okay? So if we only look at the x, y plane, in that kind of a situation, if I construct the four vector momentum P nu, what is the energy of the photon? The energy of the photon is h nu. So we have h nu upon C. Now what is Px? Px is the magnitude of the momentum of the photon along the x-axis. So the magnitude of the momentum of the photon along the x-axis is p cos phi. Yes, the component of the magnitude of the momentum of the photon along the x-axis is p cos phi. So what is p? p is equal to h nu upon c. So h nu upon c cos phi. So what is py now? py is the magnitude of the momentum of the photon along y axis which is h nu upon c sin phi. So this is equal to h nu upon c sin phi. And lastly, what is pz? Well, because the photon is only in the xy plane, pz will be equal to 0. So this is the four vector momentum corresponding to the photon with respect to the source. Fine. Now, let us also define the four vector momentum for the photon with respect to the moving observer. So, with respect to the moving observer. With respect to the moving observer, I am going to call this as P bar mu. If you remember, for moving frames of references, we denoted the four vector using a bar symbol. So, I am just going to keep that here. Okay. So, P bar mu, what is the energy? of the photon, the same photon with respect to the moving observer, it's E dash, right? So E upon C or E dash upon C is equal to H nu dash upon C. What is the momentum of the photon along the X bar axis? Well, that is P dash cos phi dash. So that we can say that this is H nu dash upon C cos phi dash, right? What is P y dash or P y bar? Well, that is h nu dash upon c sine phi dash and along the z dash z dash direction the component is equal to zero so this is the momentum four vector for the photon with respect to the moving observer now the question is how is p mu and p bar mu related to one another well if you remember from my last lecture we said that for four vectors that undergo a Lorentz transformation, that means if we go from one frame of reference to another, the physical quantity described by the four vector satisfies a particular transformation rule. And that transformation rule was given in this particular manner. 
So if we describe a physical quantity with a four vector, when we go from one frame of reference to another, then that physical quantity, in our case we have the momentum four vector, will transform according to p bar mu is equal to summation in mu is equal to 0 to 3, the Lorentz transformation matrix nu mu p nu. So this is the transformation rule that I have actually proved in my last lecture. So if you are not familiar with it, you can check that video first. So for any kind of a four vector, not just for the momentum vector, for any kind of a four vector, when we go from one frame of reference to another, that transformation is uh, demonstrated by this kind of a transformation rule. Here, lambda here is the Lorentz transformation matrix. The Lorentz transformation matrix has the familiar form where lambda nu mu is equal to, you have gamma minus gamma v upon c 0 0 you have minus gamma v upon c gamma 0 0 0 0 1 0 0 0 0 1 now do not get confused by the symbols of nu and mu here they simply mean the indices going from 0 to 3 okay so mu go for, goes from 0 to 3 and here the summation involves uh, new going from 0 to 3 that's all if I write it in its proper form what is p bar mu well p bar mu contains four terms what are these four terms let me write it as a column matrix so you have p bar 0 p bar 1 p bar 2 p bar 3 right so 0 is the time component 1 2 3 are the x y z components respectively and then here you have this Lorentz transformation matrix gamma minus gamma V upon C 0 0 minus gamma V upon C gamma 0 0 0 0 1 0 0 0 0 1 this is a Lorentz transformation matrix okay and then finally here we have P nu P nu is the momentum four vector with respect to the source or the S frame so we have P 0 P 1 P 2 P3. So essentially if you define a momentum 4 vector with respect to an S frame, the moment you go to the perspective of a moving observer's frame of reference or the moment you perform a Lorentz transformation, those components transform according to this manner. This is what this equation essentially means and it involves four different set of equations for every individual term here. But we don't need to look at the four set of equations. We are only interested in the zeroth or I would I should say the first equation. So if I write down the equation corresponding to P0, then uh, I should get something like, if you look at it, P bar zero is equal to, you multiply these terms in this row to this particular column and then you add it up, you should get gamma P0, right, minus gamma v upon c p1 right plus 0 plus 0 so this is the uh, i should say the zeroth equation or the equation corresponding to mu is equal to 0 now i will actually come up with the uh, relativistic doppler effect phenomena or the shift in the frequency from this equation that's it nothing else to do what is p bar 0 here p bar 0 is the zeroth term with respect to the moving observers uh, reference this is h nu dash upon c yes so p bar 0 is h nu dash upon c and what is p0 p0 is simply the zeroth term with respect to the source which is h nu upon c right gamma i'm taking as a common here and i should get v upon c and what is p1 p1 is the this term or the x component for the photon with respect to the source which is h nu upon c cos phi so h nu upon c cos phi so if i take h nu upon c as a common i should get 1 minus v upon c cos phi here h upon c gets cancelled and I actually end up getting the expression for relativistic Doppler effect, yes? So I end up getting nu dash 
is equal to new and here you have 1 minus v upon c cos phi and you have the gamma term which means 1 upon root over 1 minus v square upon c square. This is the general expression for the change in the frequency of a electromagnetic radiation as measured by a moving observer for the case of relativistic Doppler effect. Now this is the general expression when the light photon is going at some inclined direction, right? Usually we study transverse and longitudinal Doppler effect. So transverse effect is when the signal is coming at right angles to the moving observer and longitudinal Doppler effect is when the signal is going either towards or exactly away from the Doppler uh, moving observer, yes? So for that case, we just have to substitute phi with the appropriate angle and you should get the answer. So for example, if we look at the case of where uh, they are uh, going in the same direction. So if phi is equal to zero, in that situation, what should we get? Cos phi is equal to one, right? So if cos phi is equal to one, this is one minus V upon C. So this is root over one minus V upon C whole square. So this will become nu dash is equal to nu and you end up getting 1 minus v upon c will get cancelled with 1 minus v upon c and you will be left with root over 1 minus v upon c upon 1 plus v upon c. Okay, so this is the case for longitudinal Doppler effect for the approaching case. For the receding case, you will have phi is equal to pi and for phi is equal to pi, you will have cos phi is equal to minus 1 and then you will have minus 1. So this will become 1 plus v upon c. So this can be written as root over 1 plus v upon c whole square. So therefore, this will become nu dash is equal to nu root over. On the top, you will have 1 plus v upon c and on the denominator, you will have 1 minus v upon c. So this is the case of the receding uh, longitudinal Doppler effect. For the case of the transverse Doppler effect, phi will be 90 degrees, right? So phi is equal to pi by 2. So the relative motion of the uh, 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 observer and that of the signal is at nine, 90 degrees. So 90 degrees means this is 0. So this will become nu dash is equal to nu upon root over 1 minus v square upon c square. So these are the uh, very standard expressions for the relativistic Doppler effect phenomena for the approaching longitudinal case, receding longitudinal case and the transverse case um, for this particular uh, phenomena. But what is interesting is that I have demonstrated this phenomena using the four vector approach and as you can see the approach is quite simple, right? We have done it in uh, uh, other earlier examples uh, using very simple expressions of time dilation but this is the first time I am doing it for four vectors. So we just define the momentum four vector for the source as well as the observer and then we apply the transformation rule and from there I take up one of the equations that gives us the answer. So you see the four vector approach is not that difficult. In fact, it's quite simple once you get the hang of it. And I'll be doing a couple of more uh, videos using the four vector approach. I will solve some very common and very interesting uh, relativistic problems. So till then, uh, this is all for today. I'll see you next time. I'm Divya Jyotidas and this is For the Love of Physics. Thank you very much. Have a nice day.